Welcome, Chris. So good to have you with me, friend. Hello. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Nice to be here. So uh, Chris and I trained together at the Monastic Academy, and we've been good friends since our time together there and uh, been catching up both since we've left quite a bit. And I'd say we've gotten even closer since uh, we both left the training. And mm. um, maybe just to start off, I'd be really curious to hear about your experience with Twitter. I think, did I, uh, you, you were like lurking for a long time. And then I sort of like gently nudged you towards participating more on Twitter, right? Like what, what's that been like for you? Yeah. Um, so, so generally speaking, I haven't really been on much social media actively um, in my life, I suppose, like in, in terms of these big corporate social media um, things. And so, yeah, I, I had used Twitter sort of as like a news aggregator at times. And I always seemed to kind of get funneled into really dark places. <laughs> And at that point, it stopped being fun and started to have a negative impact. And I was like, all right, well, I guess this is just kind of how it goes. And I would leave. But yeah, you, uh, I thought you were using Twitter in a way that was different than many people who I'd seen using it. And I don't know quite how it came up, but um, oh, yeah, I, I basically talked with you about wanting to wanting to connect to more people and just kind of be able to offer some things that I didn't feel like there was a home for. And you, as you have done uh, as, as we have done, you kind of, I don't know if it was a challenge or an offer, an invitation, something, something like that. Um, you know, you kind of just gave me an in, you kind of, um, uh, helped me to, to get in there and maybe not make the same moves that I had made before that had resulted in those bad experiences. So I think that that was maybe three or four months ago. And, uh, generally speaking, it's been excellent. It's been excellent. And the metric that comes to mind of why I would say excellent is that I've made um, like at least one good friend off of Twitter, like, like someone who I really consider a friend. Um, and then I've made, made connections with many more people who um, I really am looking forward to getting to know more. And so that's sort of how I view social media as a bridge to, you know, our, our lives uh, as they are in a local context or in a physical context. Um, and so it has been a major, major success in that uh, way. And it has brought up a lot of um, a lot of difficult things around how do you express yourself to an audience of unknown individuals? Um, yeah, there's a lot that goes into that. And and so being someone who likes to joke around, who who doesn't like to be super serious all the time, when you limit the context, how do you? How do you express yourself? And that is just a, a, a real big challenge and something that I want to get better at and also something that I'm, I'm somewhat uncomfortable with. Um, so yeah, <laughs> right now I'm not actively using it and probably at some point in the future I will. But uh, yeah, it, it, it goes back and forth. <laughs> Can you say a little bit more about what the sort of tensions are that you have around what, how you'd like to express yourself and what's difficult about that? Mm. Um, I think the structure of the platform makes it really easy for people to uh, only interact with a part of what's being offered. And so it's not just that it's a, it's a domain with vast potentials for, for um, conflicting contexts or, or lacking contexts, but there's actually something kind of encouraged in the algorithm to um, take things out of context. And so the challenge for me is how to, how to put something out there that is um, either, either really rooted in context and, and within 280 characters, and so people can't really twist it. They can't get it wrong in some sense or something that is so lacking in context that it works regardless of how people want to use it. And, and so, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like life. You can't like, I, I'm a big fan of the, uh, the saying, what other people think of me is none of my business. So there's, there's that, but it's kind of turned up to, to 11. Um, and, and sometimes you get people who are hostile. I haven't encountered too much of that, thankfully, but also I, I'm not really trying to get attention necessarily. But um, 
all the same issues that um, come up in regular life and in physical life, except without the mediation of human bodies and the, the sense of respect and care that is usually present when people are in person with each other. You, it, it's not any news. I don't think that anyone listening to this probably, but people are different if they're talking face to face than if they're on the internet. And I find that people are uh, generally better versions of themselves when they have that complete context of we are both in bodies and we're maybe fragile people. And um, to make someone angry intentionally is not a great strategy in the world. So people maybe just do things that hurt people, um, but they don't get the feedback. And so that's, uh, I don't wanna encourage that. I don't want to be hurt by people like, you know, it's, it's part of being part of being alive, but I don't want to encourage people to hurt me. I don't want to become a target for abuse. Uh, then I have a responsibility, I think, to kind of like stay in relationship with them, but it's Twitter. So they don't have any, it just doesn't work. It doesn't, doesn't function as a community, even though it kind of looks like one in some ways. Hmm. Yeah. I'm almost getting this sense of, uh, just remembering my own experiences with this and putting that next to the words that you're describing of like, I'm not sure I would quite agree with it not being a community so much as like, I remember I had this one tweet, uh, I think it was last year that was about uh, freedom of speech and right speech. And, um, you know, I had just come out of the cabin like a month before. And so I was like, oh, oh I'm tweeting. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, anyway, uh, that tweet, you know, got ratioed, as they say, that got lots of uh, critical comments about it. Mm, um, mm. And, um, but anyone that knew me knew, well, one, I was talking about Buddhist right speech, as opposed to like, um, people thought that I meant like uh, censoring speech and saying like, this is approved speech or not. Whereas, mm. you know, at least in my view, right speech is, is a voluntary practice that you take up for yourself. Um, mm -hmm. But also that, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, like against free speech or something like that. It was just more like, oh, right, speech is an even higher standard that is, uh, in mm -hmm. my view, better for oneself as a personal practice. But anyway, uh, there was sort of like a division in the way that it was received of like um, people that I already knew that were connected to me and then people in the broader world that didn't have the context of who I was or what I was actually trying to say that didn't, you know, read it charitably or something like that. And mm -hmm. I guess I'd say that... Um, the, it, it, what I'm trying to say is in my experience, it is like there is community there, but then it's also in public and like it's a very, like stretches out to many people and like the farther out you go, the less actual community there is. But uh, that's just my experience with it. But yeah, and I, I think you um, just to clarify what I said, I, I think when I said it's not really a community, mm. I was speaking in that most stretched out form. And yes. I do. And that's really kind of what's made this a more. Uh, positive experience for me is that I've found pockets of communities that mm -hmm. actually seem to um, stay together and have some norms. And so there's, there's more structure and it does encourage more, um, even when there are conflicts, people seem to kind of make up, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, so there, there is a community within the whole thing, but the, the majority of Twitter to me doesn't actually seem to resemble community in the sense that I've experienced it in, in my life, you know, locally, or even in digital spaces that were a bit more mm, um, cohesive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm. Do you have a sense of what you're going to be doing going forward with your Twitter account? Um, uh, not really. Um, a couple things, maybe like strong maybes. Um, so I have, uh, I have some stuff I'm going to be working on. I'm, I'm already working on in terms of writing and I would love to be able to share that on Twitter. Um, I think that there's probably some people I'm connected to who might find these topics of interest because, you know, in this larger, um, you know, community of people who, who have animals <laughs> as their, as their avatars or vegetables as their avatars. <laughs> um, I just think that, that, that there's a curiosity there and that's generally speaking kind of what I'm what I'm doing is I'm just following my curiosities and topics that I am knowledgeable in and also connecting them to topics that I'm still 
really a novice in, but I want to learn about. And so to kind of uh, put out my thinking for, for engagement, for criticism, uh, that's really, that would be great. Gotcha. I look yeah. forward to seeing whatever writing projects you put out there. Um, yeah, maybe you could sort of zoom out a little bit and just tell me about your own personal story and background and kind of who you are and how you got here uh, to whatever <laughs> detail or uh, you'd like. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Personal story. That's a big one. That's mm -hmm. very big. Um, I've listened to a lot of your episodes and so I know how people answer this question. It's very interesting how people take it in different directions, but um, I think the way I'll answer it and feel free to, to poke me if you don't like this, but I'll speak about it in terms of what I'm working on now. Hmm. Um, and, and in many cases, these things do trace back quite a ways and I'll give some, some of that information as it uh, seems relevant. Um, if I go on so long that it seems like I'm trying to relive my life, feel free to just stop me. You can mute me. You have that power, I think. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so, um, so so things that I spend a lot of my time on, like what, what do I spend my time on right now? I, I work. Um, I work for an agency um, in the town I live in, and I, I'm a case manager for individuals with developmental disabilities. Uh, there's a lot of overlap. Um, with mental health, um, uh, there's some homelessness overlap, there's some, some refugee overlap there. And so that's my day job, um, Monday through Friday. Uh, and that, that's work that I've, I've been in that field now for about 10 years. And uh, I worked in a variety of different uh, roles in that field. And it's something that I feel, um, yeah, it's really, it's been very difficult. Uh, it's been very re rewarding. Um, I've learned a lot through it. Um, so that, that takes up a lot of my, that, that structures my life in a significant way um, and has for, for a bit. Um, also, I'm very interested in writing. I read a lot and I, I write a lot um, publicly, not so much. That is something that I'm working towards and have been for some time. So uh, I write fiction as well as nonfiction. Um, I read lots of fiction and nonfiction as well. I'm kind of been in nonfiction mode lately, but um, I just I just started reading the Glass Bead Game. Mm, by, uh, beautiful. By, yeah, yeah, you read a, it. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, loving it so far. Loving it so far. Um, so yeah, there's there's that. Um, I went to school for uh, my undergrad. I did uh, a dual major in English as well as adolescence education, and uh, I'm very interested in in education and learning the dynamics of learning um yeah I, I just i can't get enough of that really um it's sort of maybe the 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 thread that ties together a lot of my interests is just like learning development you know um individually um communally uh, on all these different levels uh linked up to that is uh i've, I've trained in brazilian jiu-jitsu for uh a handful of years and uh, took a break for a bit. I'm back doing that now. Um, yeah, I, I, oh, I guess the last piece is, um, and, and this, this is maybe the most difficult one. Or, yeah, maybe this is the most, the most difficult one to really give context to, but I was in the hardcore punk scene for about a decade of my life. And that was really formative for me. And, um, it's hard to talk about that because people don't share that context often. It's a pretty small thing, pretty small scene, even though it's spread out around the world. And so, you know, there's some, there's some aspects of that, like the DIY do it yourself ethic. Um, the aspects of like not being a spectator, not being a fan, but being a participant, you know, um, those are things that I think have really impacted me. And then, uh, just, be, you know, you already brought it up, but also I've been, um, studying, practicing, uh, I don't even know what you would call it. Um, it's like, certainly I've engaged with Buddhism and found a lot of value there, but also with other traditions as well. Um, and uh, I, 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 I don't actually even know how to talk about that very well. <laughs> like, I don't even know how to describe it, like what is happening here. And that feels, that feels all right, you know, um, that feels appropriate, yeah. 
Maybe we could zoom in a little bit to your punk background. I, I know very little bit about punk. Can you just tell me a little bit more about what that scene was like for you and what participating in it meant exactly? Yeah. Um, this is something I'm writing about. This is something I'm trying to trying to capture in writing so people can read it and, mm -hmm. and learn about that culture, but also some really relevant things I think are in there. So I've been thinking about it a lot lately, but I was about 15 years old. And uh, as a lot of teenage boys are, maybe just teenagers in general, but uh, for this boy, <laughs> for this teenage boy, uh, I was very angry. <laughs> I had a lot of anger and a lot of energy. And uh, I heard some music that just, it, it felt like it was talking about my experience or it felt like it was uh, expressing something about my experience that I hadn't seen anywhere. I had this sense that everything was kind of just false there's just so many lies that are told to you. So many things are just, well, that's the way it is, or, or just do it because I said so. And this was a scene of people who broke all the rules. Um, they didn't survive in the ways that society said you had to act to survive. Um, in some ways, it's a scene that lives off of the refuse of society. And um, there's a lot of darkness there, um, but also being, being young, and going to these shows starting off alone, little by little, you see the same people, you recognize who's really kind of, a, who's, who's just in it, um, who's booking the shows, who's in the bands, um, who's doing fanzines, and you get to know people, you make friends. And so making friends, and then there's a sense of kind of like, well, all right, we're all kind of here because we're, we're angry maybe, uh, or we were angry, or we felt really alone, but, how can we be alone if we're all together? If we're all screaming together to the same song, how, are we really alone? And there's there's a real sense of brotherhood and sisterhood and um, and support and friendship and, and a real community, the kind of thing where you can travel the country or the world and you'll always have a place to stay. Um, and, and there's a lot of um, interesting moral dimensions to it as well. Uh, I, I got introduced to vegetarian and vegetarianism and veganism through hardcore punk, and um, I adopted uh, those, and I, I continue to to work with those. Um, so yeah, there's there's all that, and then there's just the music, which is just I don't listen to much of it anymore. I, I love a lot of different kinds of music, but when I do listen to it, there's something there that I still recognize and relate to. It's it's really earnest. And it's also really ironic at the same time. And it's seemingly really offensive, but it's actually in some ways kind of like uh, some of the most high integrity uh, expressions that I'm aware of in the 20th century. And uh, I was part of it in the early 2000s, a couple of decades after it, it really had its peak, you could say. It's a topic of debate. Each generation kind of has its own thing. So when the old people, I'm an old person now, I guess, talk about it, it's it's dead. I'm talking about a thing that is dead now. Um, so, so it's still alive for someone. It's not really alive for me. I'm kind of doing an autopsy on it as I write about it. But um, yeah, it just it, it, it's it's a very intense culture. There's a lot of um, intense elements to it, and um, rites of passages that people go through quite naturally that I think were really beneficial for me. And at the same time, uh, there's some people, it's arguable if it was a positive influence for them. So it's like everything, you know, it, 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 all, it all depends, you know. You say you're not too actively involved in the scene now and you don't listen to the music as much these days, but would you say that there are any of those elements of that culture that have carried over into the way that you're living your life now? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Um, I'm pretty allergic to the concept of um, parasocial relationships. Um, that's another aspect of Twitter that is difficult to, to deal with. Um, yeah, I'm pretty allergic to that. Um, I, I feel the need to, to give back to the things that I have found value in, you know, which uh, is something that I kind of learned from, from that scene, I think. And uh, you know, there, there's a way that, oh boy, just Tasha, tired. You're, you're yawning at me. Oh boy. Just tired, my man. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Uh, I had to though. I had to. Um, there's a way that, um, you know, people can be turned off by, by 
seemingly offensive things or seemingly intense things. And so it kind of, you acclimate to it in a certain way. You don't desensitize to it, but you become familiar with it. And you, you, I sort of have a radar now, which um, I don't know how to describe it, but you know it when you see it. I have kind of a sense of people who have this mentality, this attitude um, where, you know, you, you can become fast friends with them. So um, it, I think it really improved my, um, my sense of safety with other people and my sense of like, um, yeah, just, just understanding what, what, what community can look like when community is really working, what can that look like? And, uh, it can be absolutely incredible. And having tasted that, having experienced that, I'm not willing to settle for things that people call community. Uh, an app is not community, you know, and I'm, I'm not willing to allow that word to be, to be watered down like that. Hmm. Fascinating. Um, you, you, uh, worked as a personal trainer for a time too. Is that right? Yeah. Um, when I had entered into the field, working with individuals with developmental disabilities for a couple of years, um, I had a client who, who I was supporting who passed away. It was pretty stressful during that period of time to support, to support them. And I was like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And what, what can I do that is still, you know, uh, my interests and, and, and also I think is like good. And so I decided to do that. And, uh, I studied and I became a personal trainer, but I didn't really engage with it, um, in like a financial way. Um, I would work with people who had questions and I would work with people for free or like, just, Hey, we're hanging out. You made me a meal. I'll, I'll show you this stuff. I'll, I can answer questions. Um, only recently did I actually get paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I just didn't like the models. I didn't think the models of personal training worked out well. So technically, yeah, I have a certificate right here that says like, oh yeah, you're a personal trainer. But, um, in the way that many people think of it, no, I was, I was never a person who was like, you'll pay me X number of dollars for 30 minutes. Like, I, I don't think that works. And so I never went that, that route. What do you, uh, find flawed with that kind of model? Um, generally I found that, uh, it creates dependency. There's that, um, you know, I, uh, once people think that there's an expert out there who can tell them how to walk, right. They get a little funny about walking on their own. And I think that's not good. It's not good. It's disempowering on some level. Um, so yeah, I, I think that the model of the trainer telling you what to do or maybe even being mean to you. And some people actually wanting someone to boss them around, to push them. Mm, I just don't think that's good. I think uh, developing a closer relationship with your own body and having someone kind of model that for you is super beneficial, but we generally know, I think kind of what's good for us. We know that going for a walk is better than sitting on the couch all day. You know, we, we know this, no one needs to tell us. So the issues are more around motivation and around finding fits for our lives, but Mm, to pay a significant amount of money to people to, to basically make you more dependent is, is the opposite of helpful, I think. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, a little while ago, you and I worked together on this issue, and I found the, the sort of model that you created as an alternative to this was one of the best experiences of my life with respect to fitness, I'd say, or, or movement. I'm in glad general. to hear that. Yeah. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe just to be helpful, I'll describe that, the, what I experienced at least as some context, and then I'll ask my question about it. But sure. um, yeah, so I mean, I've done various movement practices over the years and uh, came to Chris and said, uh, you know, I wanted his help kind of with uh, essentially strength training. Chris had told me some things about strength training, and I was interested. And he said, okay, well, write up what your goals are, like what you're doing now and what your goals are and any ideas that you have about uh, where you'd like to go and how you'd like to get there. And so I wrote something about that, maybe like a page or so. Um, and then we had a, an hour long conversation about it. And it was just a conversation. There, there was no like movement practice during the conversation. Uh, we were just talking about uh, the movement practices that I was currently doing and my goals. And so Chris made some specific suggestions based on the things that I said for how I might have those goals uh, move forward towards them. And 
it felt really like co-creative in terms of um, I, it was it was actually fascinating. I was I noticed in that conversation how much was like being pulled out of me that I like had forgotten that I knew about movement practices and um, like putting a lot of different pieces together and um, the the sort of exercise plan that we came up with is not something that I think any other one person would have been able to be like, okay, you're going to do this because it combines so many different things. You know, I was like, oh, I'm dancing a lot and doing Tai Chi and I have these knee injuries and I'd like to gain in strength training. And, you know, you recommended a specific program that I look into, but also said do this and like balance it this way. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, it just felt very like co-creative in a way that, um, and it was a conversation based it, there was no like, you know, you hang out with me at the gym or something like that. It was, <laughs> uh, it was a conversation and it felt like it respected my own intelligence and background and preferences and needs. And I really liked that, but I'd be curious to hear from you what, what went into that kind of thing for you in terms of what you like to do when you work with people and why. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, am I hearing you right? Like kind of talk about the history of like, just how I came to that perspective. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good place to start. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I never went into a gym. I was very intimidated of gyms. I was like a very nerdy kid. I loved to read, loved mm -hmm. to read. And uh, I was decent at sports, the ones that I participated in, but like I didn't. Oh, that's where we depart. I was a nerdy kid that loved to read and not so good with the sports. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't, um, I didn't like how, um, how, how mean people got sometimes around the competition. I just didn't, I didn't like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I never went to a gym. No one ever got me into a gym like maybe once in gym class in, in high school. But anyway, when I was in college, I was living with some, some people who they were really, they were really doing it. And some of them were really genetically gifted, just like, you know, different than me. Um, and uh, I got invited once. And at the time I was having a significant amount of anxiety and I didn't know why. I didn't even know what anxiety was. I just knew that I was feeling different. Um, and so I was open to anything that was gonna change whatever I was feeling. And, uh, well, like they loaded up the, the, the barbell with 225 pounds to do shrugs. And I was like, well, I guess I'll do 225 pound shrugs too. And like, you know, pull the muscle. <laughs> and, but, but the feeling I had afterwards of just being like, I had exerted this energy and my mind was so much sharper. And that feeling of anxiety of kind of like, um, a sickness in my belly, um, like a, like a, like a buzzing in my, in my whole body, just a little bit too much just had, had subsided. And I, I found that when I went to go write papers, it was just like, I was just tuned in. And so I was like, say no more. And I just made it a routine. And I said to myself, I'm never going to stop for the rest of my life. I'm never going to stop. Um, I have not, I have not, not stopped. I have stopped for some periods of time and I've changed my modalities. And so I just went through all these different modalities um, barbell training, uh, training with dumbbells, training with kettlebells, um, doing lots of hiking, um, uh, running, uh, it's mean that you encourage me to get into and learn, um, uh, getting into yoga and, uh, just, just many, many different, and I'm talking, when I'm talking about physical yoga in this context, um, uh, so just doing all those different things, I, I just recognize like, you know, what I thought at the beginning was just about barbells. It's like, nope, it's, there's a lot of ways into this. And so to think that one is the way is, is just very misguided. And the more I encounter stuff, the more I have been able to just develop some basic principles to apply to myself. And to the degree that those basic principles seem relevant or useful to other people, then it's like, oh, okay, like we can talk. But if someone wanted to know like the ins and outs of barbell training, I would tell them to go find someone who's extremely knowledgeable in barbell training. Like personally, I can structure barbell training for myself, but if you're looking for an expert in that, I am not that. My, my whole approach is really just fitting things in with your life, um, not making fitness your entire life, unless you're an athlete. If you're not an athlete, this should not be taking up a really huge chunk of your life. Um, I, I don't think so. Um, I think it can be done more efficiently. And so I just wanted to find kind of the minimum viable form. And uh, from working with people, what I found was the specifics really kind of tripped people up. 
So it was much better to, to work with people with what they've done before and what they're comfortable with and what they like and encourage them to stop doing things that feel wrong to them or that have gotten them injured or that uh, are intimidating to them right now. Um, and just setting goals, you know, th these are, these are pretty basic ideas that I think can be applied to a lot of different things, but for the same reason, maybe that I was a 21 year old who had never worked on their body consciously. Um, I think there's a, there's a sense that we're intimidated maybe by these things. And if someone's a nerd, which I use the word nerd positively, I, I I'm a fan of nerds. Um, I, I myself may or may not be a nerd. It's up to, to you to decide whoever's listening to this. I uh, hope you're doing well wherever you are. <laughs> but um, I think if you apply the nerd mindset, like the, the, the mindset that, that is curious and seeks to understand and, and is willing to ask questions to the physical domain, it's not that complicated. And I think that those two things pair very well and they balance each other very well. So one without the other, mm, um, I said this recently that, that intelligence is a liability, you know? And I think that working with the body, applying your, your, if you think you have a great mind, well, why don't you prove that through your body? Why don't you express that through your body? And to the degree you're not able to do that, well, maybe your mind isn't so absolutely incredible in the sense that it can figure everything out and do everything on its own. Maybe it's important to involve other things, other people. Um, so, so it's just, there's no question when you move a weight that you moved that weight, you picked that weight up, your form was good. You can videotape yourself from the side when you're doing a squat or doing a, doing a, a deadlift or videotape yourself from the side, videotape yourself in the front. You can determine these things because there's so much information available. And so um, just reflecting that back to people that you are more than smart enough to structure this yourself. You just need to be realistic that it's gonna take an investment. You're not gonna see results overnight. You have to put in the work and that's gonna show up. But to have something that is so visually um, uh, clear, I find I found that to be so uh, valuable. And then there's people whose goals are not visual at all. And that is also very possible to do. And um, just my general approach, I guess, is that if, if you're listening to this right now and you have a body, um, you can develop a better relationship with your body. You know, like, like a problem you have, you can get a better handle on. Um, a goal you have, you can, you can progress towards it. You can get stronger in your strengths. Your weaknesses can also become stronger. You can learn more, even from injuries. You know, injuries are super um, educational. They have been for me. It all depends on your perspective. Um, so, so that's my, that's like kind of what, what brought me here and why I didn't become a personal trainer because the model of someone you pay to show you exercises, YouTube exists. We don't, we don't really need that anymore. If you have a phone, if you have a phone with a camera on it and you have YouTube, you can go pretty far. You don't need someone to confuse you perhaps, or try to sell you on some supplements on the way out the gym door, or even to have to drive to the gym. Time is, time is a precious resource. And so can you do all this stuff at your home? Probably. It all depends on your preferences and what you'd like to do. You know, you, maybe you don't have a swimming pool at your home and you want to swim. Okay. But, uh, I think people are really limited. People's sense of where this stuff occurs is very limited. And I would prefer to not um, mm, strengthen those, those perceived limitations. Uh, like, like you mean that movement is something that only happens at the gym, for example, that's like a limiting. Yeah. Thing. For example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, say someone wanted to work with you, what, what would that process look like in terms of what kinds of steps would you take them through or what does that involve? Um, I think it depends on each person, it depends on their situation. It depends on um, what they want, where, the, where they are. Um, very similar to kind of what you talked about in terms of what are your goals? Like what, what are your goals that maybe you don't feel like you know how to get there, or you're not satisfied with the, the speed at which you're approaching them. Maybe you just need a voice to tell you, wow, your progress is actually really good. Like that's based on all this research, that's actually as, about as good as it gets. So uh, in that sense, maybe I'm just kind of reinforcing what someone already knows and 
um, offer them a little bit of um, reinforcement that that they're on the right track, that their instincts are are correct, that they're doing they're they're doing they're doing well for what they want. Um, yeah, it all depends really on what they want um, mm -hmm. and, and how they communicate. Uh, I have my biases towards um, efficiency and time, um, injury proofing, not disallowing activities after your, your training time or before your training time. You know, I like to go hiking. So I just, I just factor that into my, my, my whole routine. Um, there's a way of doing squats, you know, when we're like squats are like the king of exercises. That's, that's one of the things that's said about them. And I think that's generally speaking, pretty true. They're just incredible for many, many reasons. Um, but some people could say, oh yeah, I do squats. And for a couple hours after they do squats, if someone, if someone like stole their bag and ran away, they can't chase that person down. Like, oh, what an athlete you are. You went to the gym. You're so big. You're so strong. You can't, you can't run more than hundred feet now because you expended all of your, your strength and your energy and your legs. And you're going to be limping. Maybe even some people are just, I mean, they're hardcore. They have certain goals. There's, there's valid reasons to do that to yourself. I don't think hobbyists or people who work like office jobs are athletes. And I don't think they should train like athletes. Um, I think they should train so that they're capable of doing whatever it is to squat down and play with a child or, um, to be able to go for a hike if someone invites them to, or go for a long walk and talk. A lot of people are, are their, their sense of training and their sense of recovery. Mm, in my view, in my experience, uh, there's not enough emphasis on recovery. There's not enough consideration of there's more than one way to go here. A lot of people seem to really emphasize the, the, the aesthetics. They, they imbibe unconsciously a lot of bodybuilding philosophy and a lot of bodybuilding techniques and approaches, and they don't recognize that. And so maybe, and when I say maybe, I mean, I think so for myself, <laughs> but maybe there's an approach that actually gets you some of those aesthetic gains and also allows you to do other things and doesn't have some of those drawbacks because you're not going to be going on stage with your body all oiled up to show off your muscles. That's not your life, you know? So, so why live, why train the way those people train? It's just about kind of accepting it's maybe it sounds corny, but it's kind of a matter of accepting yourself, accepting your life, like be realistic. Like when you go to the gym, you're not suddenly an athlete. You can train with the intensity and the single, the single pointed focus that an athlete does when they go in the gym. That's great. They call them concentration curls for a reason. A lot of people miss that. There's a, there's a neurological uh, connection you can make to your muscles. It actually changes the way your muscle gets worked and changes the way that your body then develops in response to that stress. But to, 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 to not recognize, I'm not going to be a star athlete. I'm not going to be uh, winning um, jujitsu competitions, you know, like on, on some high level. Um, I'm not going to be winning even a 5k run probably. <laughs> and I can say that because, because you beat me, you beat me in a 5k run we did um, and a 10k run we did. Um, so, so just accepting that, you know, and, and putting it in its proper place, which I think takes a lot of the pressure off. It doesn't have to be so dire. It's, it's supposed to feel good. And so just hopefully modeling that, just modeling kind of a low key, like, yep, this is just part, part of life. We should care for our bodies. There's some benefits to it. And if you're interested in that, let's talk about it, you know? Hmm. It seems like the process is basically like have the person get clear about what they want and what they're doing currently. And then you have a conversation and iterate on that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a decent way to put it. Hmm. Um, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned the connection between sort of the intellectual mind and the physical body and those practices and how they're mutually supportive and ideally they're they're sort of balanced rather than separate from each other. And um, I actually used to have this project that was sort of a precursor to this podcast that was called Mind Body Attention. And uh, hmm. you can still find it on the internet. It's mindbodyattention.com. But uh, I was interested in basically those three things of like intellectual endeavors, physical movement practices, and contemplative practice and how those could be mm. 
mutually supportive and um, uh, and talking to people that were interested in all three. And I know you're interested in all three as well, which is part of why we have a lot of synergy and in, um, in terms of our interests and the things we want to explore. And yeah, I'd be curious to switch gears a little bit and talk about contemplative practice. Um, maybe just starting by hearing what I, I'd be curious to hear what your practice is like right now. I know for me, uh, my practice has really blossomed and evolved and <laughs> in interesting directions in, in recent months. So I'd be curious mm. to hear what you're up to these days. Mm, mm. Um, yeah. Before I go into that, I, mm -hmm. I, I should just give a disclaimer that um, similar to the, con the context issue with Twitter, you know, like I'm speaking, this is very obvious, but also I think it's helpful to say I'm speaking from my own experience. I don't have like, um, I don't have answers for you, whoever you are. I don't, I don't know your life. I'm speaking from my experience and I'm trying to speak carefully so that um, it may apply and be useful. And at the very least not be harmful, you know, like doctors, you know, the, the Hippocratic Oath. Um, so uh, in relation to that, one of the things that is very alive in my practice is um, uh, expressing myself. <laughs> Like this is not um, this is not something that I'm I'm used to doing to speaking on recording. Um, it's not something I'm comfortable doing, and so this is an aspect of you know I don't I don't really think of it in terms of like oh this is my practice um, because uh, it's just a blurry line like ideally everything in your life is practice I think. Um, I was going to, this is a tweet I didn't send, but it feels right to share in this context, but I was in the supermarket recently and I was noticing all these drinks in like the water or like the vitamin water area. And almost all of them had spiritual names. Like they had pictures of the Buddha and like there was this one drink I think called Zenify. And so I was taking the pictures of all these and each one I thought was the last one. And there was more and more like five or six different brands. And I was just and the sayings on them were just, oh, just gross. Just real, really trying to tap into that projection of Eastern uh, philosophy that it's like, yeah, you won't actually get anything of value out of this, but you're gonna buy our drink because you want a little bit of that shine. And so I was gonna tweet a picture of the Zenify cans and say, um, the next person who asks me how my practice is, is going to be waterboarded with this. Um, and I decided that wouldn't be appropriate to tweet, but I'm sharing it now because I hope that my, my laughter, like the way I'm, this is ridiculous. That's a joke. Like there, there are very serious aspects built into this joke, but to like attack me for it, I'm sorry, but you don't have any ground here. Like there's no, there's no way you can take offense to this unless you're looking to, in which case, hello, you can reach out to me on Twitter. Um, <laughs> You can do what do what you'd like to do, I suppose. Uh, I would like to become friends with you. But anyway, <laughs> um, so, so yeah, my practice, uh, my work, you know, like my, my work is um, at times really difficult um, in terms of, for me, processing a lot of difficult emotional things that come up through my work, a lot of sad situations that can come up for some of my clients. And um, uh, also working with people who have trauma, um, learning about that. And then personally, you know, same, same thing, just how do I, how do I live my life? How do, how do I not get um, blocked up by coming into contact with these things that are real, that people have experienced or are experiencing that I don't have the ability to change? Um, how can I be around that, be adjacent to that and, um, and still be, you know, feeling that I'm doing my best, feeling that, you know, um, I'm okay. So that's, that's, a, that's a big part of things. Um, in terms of sitting practice, uh, mostly I do some meta. Uh, I like meta. Um, you were the first person to ever introduce me to meta, um, which is pretty cool. And, and I kind of took what you taught me and like just modified it a little bit. I'm a little bit traditional with it. So I use that if I, if I need to, um, sort of like, per, sort of with, with a purpose. Otherwise I am uh, currently using a technique called Shine, which is um, 
as I understand it, a form of shamatha. It is uh, shine without form, generally. And uh, that has had some interesting effects that I, I'm not I'm not knowledgeable enough about Shine or what comes after Shine to say, but uh, seems very pleasant. <laughs> like it seems like it's really fit in with my life. Um, you know, uh, friendships, I would say, are like a, you know, to go back to that, that P word, the P word, like you'd say that like friendships, relationships are, are a big part of practice. Um, and it's like, well, what does that look like? It doesn't look like anything fucking weird. You know, I'm not. I'm not like calling my friends up and being like, oh, now we talk, you know, it's, it's like just normal, just like, just, just keeping your word, you know, like, like recognizing your limitations, uh, feeling when maybe you've overextended yourself and, you know, you need to, you need to rest a bit. It's, it's very similar to physical training, you know, in that sense. So, um, yeah, I've been doing a lot of off cushion stuff. I'm really interested in a lot of off cushion stuff. So um, I've been doing a technique that I picked up from Mato Moore uh, from one of his books. Uh, I can't remember. Spreading out the vision is the name of the, te the technique. And so I've been doing that a bit and noticing some very subtle and uh, pleasant shifts in, in my experience. And playing around with view, um, studying, uh, I don't know if that sounds like anything. I just said a bunch of stuff and I don't know if that sounds like I said anything coherent, which if that's the case, or if it makes sense, either way, it sounds about right to me. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I just feel kind of like I'm just, I'm just living my life and trying to learn. And, um, to a significant degree, I suppose I'm, I'm still asking the question of, is this Buddhism? Like, am I engaging with Buddhism or am I engaging with something that is too personal to even consider Buddhism. That's a that's a live question for me. Mm. Interesting. I don't think I'd articulate it that way, but that's certainly a question that's been alive in my own practice, especially as I've uh, diverged from various things that I've received or com mm. even just combined different things that I've received, uh, mm. but mm. certainly diverged or, uh, yeah. Um, You've been involved with the Evolving Ground community, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How's that been for you? Oh, it's been lovely. It's been been excellent. Um, it's been a year that I've been involved there, and um, yeah, it's a, it's it's a very I've experienced it as uh, a great space to learn, great space to explore, um, very clear standards um, in terms of you know we're not putting people on pedestals. Um, very similar in many ways to the hardcore punk thing I was talking about, you know, um, there's an encouragement on participating if you want to participate actively, um, just appreciating and enjoying and finding value in it as an observer, if that's what's right for you right now, there's all different positions. And so, yeah, uh, it has just opened up a whole world uh, regarding Buddhism that previously I did not feel equipped to approach. So it it has allowed me to approach some things that I find very intriguing. Um, and uh, so far, I, I, I don't have, it's kind of nice actually to not really have a map, to have something be like unmappable. I don't know really anything in terms of like where to place myself, but whatever is going on, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well said, I would agree with that. Mm. No map, but this seems good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'll yeah i'm really impressed place. yeah i i have to say that i'm really impressed with how the group has been structured because mm -hmm. some community structures can lead to some unsavory outcomes and i've just been continually impressed by how the community itself as well as the founders are um constantly adapting and adjusting and 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 communicating and i just find it to be an extremely healthy um healthy environment to, to explore and learn and to make mistakes. Um, it, you have to, I, I have to feel like I can make mistakes. I have to feel like it's not the end of the world to make a mistake. Mm. And I feel very willing to, to not know there, you know, which is a good sign for me. Mm. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. Mm. 
I think one of the questions I'm most interested in talking to you about, at least today, is um, about sort of your, your work with, um, you know, I don't know that you described the field this way, but I would describe it just hearing you talk about it as like social work. Uh, what your perspective is on how to actually help people. Um, you know, there are various people in my life that I want to help or be of benefit to that seem to need help, uh, mm -hmm. seem to be suffering in their lives. And often it feels sort of like, uh, well, to put it simply challenging, you know, how to actually mm -hmm. be of benefit to someone. It's, it's easy to uh, seem like you're being of benefit or it's easy to feel like you're being mm -hmm. of benefit, but how to actually help someone. Uh, what your thoughts are about that yeah um it's a gigantic topic um i don't think a disclaimer is needed before i start to talk about like before i start to respond about this topic because the disclaimer is sort of the key i think the disclaimer being similar to what i said before that it all depends like it, it all depends on the circumstances. Um, so there's that. Um, but maybe a better place to start would be um, having awareness of your motivations and, and, and your needs, maybe how they interact, they brush up, or if things got more difficult, how would they interact with the situation in which you are trying to help? Um, there's something I've heard a handful of times about help in terms, uh, basically that the, the best sort of help is when you're not aware of being a helper. Um, that seems quite clean, but it's also maybe like the end, like the, the, the high end level of things. So checking your motivations and, and being honest about like, how secure are you? And what happens if in the course of helping this person, you become insecure in your, uh, your basic needs? And um, there's no way, I don't feel like there's a way for me to talk about this right now from where, from, from, from where I am, from what I've experienced without talking about death. Because hmm. I think that death is fundamental to, our, um, to how we approach this. Because uh, let's say, for instance, somebody approaches you for help. So right off the bat, someone has approached you for help. That's really great. Um, to go out in the world and decide you're going to go help people could result in a lot of different outcomes. You don't know people's circumstances, so how could you help them? That's, that's, my, that's my feeling. And so when someone approaches you for help, you have at least a sense, you have at least one point of data that this person wants or needs my help. Um, so from that point, you can start to consider like, okay, like what is it they're asking? Maybe it's something super simple, like, hey, I need help crossing the street. This is very easy, right? Person needs help crossing the street. Um, if they're duping you, you don't lose much. You just walked across the street with someone. Maybe they video, they had a video tape on you or a video camera on you. It's like, oh, no big deal. You don't lose anything. But some situations where you help people, there's a potential for you to gain something and there's a potential for you to lose something. And I think that once that gets involved, the situation becomes a lot more complicated. So um, Going back to the thread that I, I put down a little bit, which is that if someone's help is like prolonged, if you're trying to help someone for a prolonged period and all of a sudden you have problems with your housing or your ability to secure food or to be safe, and that person was relying on you, like they are not able to care for themselves in some fundamental way. And you said, I'll be there. But all of a sudden now you feel like you're not able to care for yourself. That's a very rough and difficult situation. So, so I guess the first point I'm making after all this talking is um, to kind of deal with 
not as in like you solve your own situation, but to, to come to a certain level of um, awareness about your own situation and about what is, what is and isn't going to impact your ability to, to remain in a position to help, you know, being really honest with yourself because to start helping someone and not be able to see it through, I'm not sure if I would call that help. Mm -hmm. That could cause a lot of problems because the process of someone healing or being helped, um, the, the middle period, in my experience, is maybe more unformed, more unknown, more vulnerable, harder to identify, perhaps. And so to get started and then to, to pull out of that, at least before the person had stability in a situation that they knew now they're in a whole new situation, maybe the new, new feelings, new thoughts, um, new people, new surroundings, and for the support to remove itself. Uh, I, I would never, I would never want that to happen. Um, so, so that's a big one is just like, are you in a position to help someone? Mm -hmm. Um, and then generally speaking, like, are you, are you in a position to help with this situation, maybe you can help on some levels, but just knowing yourself and, and understanding the circumstances and having a relationship with that person to the degree where you can uh, determine that for yourself. No one can really, you can, you can look for advice if you want to from other people, but ultimately it's you. It's, 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 it's the person who's being asked to help or who, who sees an opportunity to help who has to really recognize that and to examine that for themselves. Um, yeah, does that, does that answer the question or is there like a direction maybe that comes up or I don't know how all that sounds to you. Yeah, it's a, it's a great answer. Um, let me make sure I understand correctly. You're saying that like, one, it's helpful to know whether they're asking for the help or not. Ideally, they're asking for the help and also that you're clear about your motivations for helping them and that they're mm. sort of wholesome and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that you're also clear about who you are and what you're capable of doing and, and whether you're actually in a position to help them mm -hmm. either in general or with the specific thing that they're mm -hmm. having and, and making sure that there's sort of, um, that you're setting up a context where there can be trust as opposed to doing something where you say you'd help them and then turns out that you're not able to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, um, it's just the, the, the simple phrase of like, don't write checks you can't cash, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, being true to your word, mm -hmm. you know, basic integrity, which is um, basic, but maybe not, not easy. <laughs> so true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know that there's almost certainly limits to what you can say about this, but I'd be curious to hear about your work experience, either with your current job or in the past, just like, mm, yeah, I've used this phrase on the podcast before, but um, uh, in, in, in one of the platonic dialogues, there's an explanation about the beginning of the universe and they say, tell me a likely story. You know, they, <laughs> they don't want like a factual account, uh, uh, you mm. know, but like, tell me something that like could be true. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. So I'd be curious to hear, let's say a likely story about, you know, you helping someone, you know, they're, you know, the, not real details about someone, but what it sort of looks like, what the shape of it is that you might be uh, sure. helping someone, if that makes sense. Sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah, and I think it is actually easier, you know, just reflecting on, on how I answered the question you just mm -hmm. asked, you know, it's also general, it can almost seem like I'm talking about nothing. So mm -hmm. for me to relate it more to my work, mm -hmm. which maybe there's not shared context, but I think there's more Mm -hmm. more shared context there it's a lot easier mm -hmm. um so okay um here's the likely <laughs> here's the likely uh, situation um when i started working in this field i was working direct support which means i was helping people with their um activities of daily living as as we call it in the field um so that's stuff like getting clothed preparing food, eating, toileting, hygiene stuff. Um, and then related to that is stuff like you have to go to the doctor or you have to go to the store to buy this thing you want. And then of course, there's just like, that's all really um, basic human needs. And then there's, then there's the, the like enrichment and the joy of life, which you can have, you can be joyful through all that stuff, but 
many people have things they want to do otherwise. They have interests they want to pursue. But in the case of people with developmental disabilities, sometimes they're not able to independently do that. And so you have staff people, often called direct support, direct support professionals, who help them with that. And so um, I guess I'll give a couple of different examples because um, one on its own, I think, would be misrepresentative. So there's some people who, um, and, and, and a lot of people, if they reach a certain age, will be in this position. And there's a lot of discomfort around it, but people who can, people who can evacuate their bowels, but who cannot clean up after that, or people who can't urinate cleanly in a toilet in, in a way that leaves the bathroom clean for other people to use. Um, and so, uh, there's a lot of ways you can try to help in that situation that doesn't help. Maybe, um, people generally speaking, want privacy. And, and in this field, I've been lucky enough to learn all these interesting little things that I didn't think ever, I never would have thought these, that facts and actual information on these things worked, but, or existed, but there's factors actually that go into, uh, this is, it's so great that I'm talking about this on your podcast, Tashin. You can label the podcast, maybe, uh, Chris talks about bowel movements, um, <laughs> but, uh, some elements that go into taking a shit that people might not think about is if your feet are on the floor. If your feet are on the floor, that's great. So say you have a client who's less than five feet tall and they sit on the toilet and their feet are not contacting the floor. As someone who's helping them, I can get a stool that's in the bathroom, maybe under the sink or behind the toilet. And I can just put it there. I can, I can put it there and then I can leave the room because another factor in helping people go to the bathroom is privacy. Some people don't care. I've experienced it. Some people have no they're not affected by that, but most people, it seems like they are affected by it. And so the minimum, um, minimum observation, you know, like, like doing the, the least while still helping is, is, is kind of like a, a good principle that, that, you know, like if someone's in the bathroom for two, three, four minutes, and I know that maybe, maybe they'd start doing stuff that isn't good for them, or, uh, maybe they, uh, they're just waiting, you know, like I'm not going to wait until that person calls for me or if they're nonverbal stands up and comes to the door, I'm going to, I'm going to be attentive. I'm going to be attentive and, and, and aware of the situation and get a sense over time as I know that person for how long it takes them in the bathroom. And, and this sounds like such a, maybe a silly example, but if we get old, someone may have to help us with this. And so to the degree that we're uncomfortable with this, to the degree that we think they're like, oh, not me. I just want to remind everyone, shit comes out of your ass. Shit comes out of your asshole, maybe every day. And uh, as long as you're eating, it's going to keep on coming out. And so knowing how to help someone in this basic way, I think is actually quite important, you know, um, to have a relationship with people who trust you to develop trust with people so that when they're older, you can provide them with dignity in these situations because unfortunately around this single, this single topic, this single example, a lot of people are not treated with dignity. Mm. Um, and that trickles down mm. and, uh, mm. and it also trickles up. I know that doesn't even make any sense, but I'm saying it anyway, but when you treat people with dignity around these issues, it matters. Mm. It, mm. it matters and it shows up and it, it shows up mainly in terms of a relationship in terms of trust. And so, that's some stuff around helping someone in one example. Uh, here's another example. Uh, you meet a person who is unlike anyone you've ever met before. Uh, and in this field, that's often the case. This field really lets you kind of see that each individual is so unique and you need to get to know them. There's, there's a phrase in the field that says, do not presume intellect. And I think that you can expand that phrase to really don't presume, just don't presume. Hmm. Um, so there's some people who you meet who are just different from anyone you've ever met before. Maybe they have a chromosomal disorder where, um, there's just differences in the way they communicate and the way they relate to people that it's not the way you do. And so this is a person who, as far as you're concerned, is maybe the only person with that condition you're ever going to meet. And it's not just like they have a condition you can read out of a textbook. They also have a personality and they have all their experiences and they have 
all the other stuff that comes along with being a human. And so you meet this person and uh, maybe it's a year. It's a year until they say a single word to you. Mm. Um, and, but the whole time you haven't been pressuring them. Hey, talk to me. Hey, say my name. Hey, do this. Cause you can tell cause you've read about them cause you know about them cause you've been in their home for day after day for overnights. You see them when they're waking up, you see them when they're going to sleep. You're consistently supportive of them and, and, and trying to be helpful, even though you don't really know how to do that. Um, and well, this person who is not like anyone you've ever met before, who you're slowly developing trust, they have a really hard time with dental appointments, hmm. as a lot of people do. There can be discomfort, there can be pain. And this person doesn't have any way to communicate that. So you have to be their translator. You have to, you have to be able to let the doctor know like, these signals that this person's putting out that the doctor won't understand, you have to say it to the doctor in a way that is both true and, and relevant to the doctor's uh, understanding and needs as a doctor, as a dentist, and also that isn't talking about the person in a way that is undignified or disrespectful. Mm -hmm. There is a way to do that. Mm -hmm. um, it is much more difficult than not caring in either of those directions. It's really easy to talk about people if we just don't care how they feel or if we think that they're not gonna feel anything about it. You know, it's so easy just to say words. Um, and maybe the, maybe the exam goes, maybe the exam goes off without a hitch, but hmm, in this uh, imaginary situation, let's say this person, hmm, nine times out of 10, they go to the dentist. It is not a success. They do not sit down in that chair and they do not get their mouth examined. Hmm. But over time, you find all the ways it can go wrong. You see the other staff, how they talk with other people, how they, how they deal with the whole thing. You can see the anxiety building. You can see the anxiety subsiding with the, with the, with the client, um, with the person who you're trying to help. And you learn all these things. And also, you know from talking to this person, even though they only communicate in head nods or head shakes, and maybe sometimes they'll whisper words, like they'll just whisper, they'll repeat things. The more you get to know them, they'll, they'll talk a little bit more. You know when you ask them, hey, do you want to go to the dentist? They say no. And then it's like, do you want your mouth to be clean? And they say yes. And it's like, are you willing to go to the dentist? And they say yes. And so like, you've talked them through this. And now you go to the dentist and there's all these procedures that this individual has had um, written up for them by professionals who have to sign off on these things. And so you know all, all the potential tools at your disposal. So before they go to the appointment, they get a PRM. So an as needed like anti-anxiety medication. So you know that that can even make things go wrong. That could make this person who's got a great sense of humor, um, <laughs> they might decide, you know what? There's a new staff around. I'm gonna play a little game where I pretend like I'm asleep and I can't wake up. And that means I get to miss my dentist appointment. Now mm -hmm. they already told you they wanted their teeth to be cleaned and they were willing to go to the dentist. So at a certain point, you don't push anymore. So if they're really pretending to be asleep, done deal, cancel the appointment. Okay, but let's say we do the PRN, we go to the doctor, you're doing some positive talk. You're not, you're not doing anything that's going to kind of scare them. You're trying to create a comfortable environment where they can just be doing what they're doing. Low key, low key. It's not a big deal. Maybe you talk about your dentist appointment that you just had and how it was okay. And how nice the dentist is be like, Hey, do you like this dentist? Maybe they don't like the dentist, in which case you're in a position to help them get a better dentist. There's mm. all these variables. There's all these factors. And some people there's really only one person who can communicate and handle the situation around them in a way that leads to a success in this limited specific situation. And so maybe you're that one person and you go to the dentist and you know, oh, if there's a chair around, this person's going to sit in the chair. They're not going to get up and they're not going to sit in the exam thing. They're going to sit in that chair until they know we can go to the van and leave without having done it. But for that individual, the most successful outcome is actually to sit in that chair, to lay back. And once they've done that, they accept it and they go with it. And they're happy at the end. And you were there and you give them positive feedback at the end and you let them know like, oh, you don't have to do that again for however many months and, and it's gonna go well next time too. And, and you can say that if you know you're gonna be involved. Mm. If you don't know you're gonna be involved, don't make promises about the future. You know, like don't tell people it's gonna be okay or so-and-so is gonna do this because you can't control what so-and-so is gonna do. Um, so, so that's the second example. Um, there's really big ones too. 
you know, just in terms of uh, working with clients who have trauma or who have maybe personality disorders, um, who uh, routinely, we can say, fire their staff um, so that they get upset with staff, um, creates kind of like a combative relationship. The staff get a little emotional. The staff kind of don't want to deal with the client. The client senses that, which is kind of what the whole thing started from. So in those positions, it's just a long, long process of just building basic trust where, hey, you call me on the phone. And, and I just want to name because I'm, I'm in this context. So sometimes I can kind of lose sight of what people might know. But developmental disability is a gigantic spectrum. So you've got individuals with very low IQs with very low expressive abilities. You also have individuals with very high IQs and very high expressive abilities. Um, everything you can possibly imagine is possible in, in this field. So I don't want to limit it to some, some image. The first two examples I gave would be people with lower IQs and lower expressive abilities. But this third example is someone with higher expressive abilities, someone who maybe if you met them in person, you wouldn't even know they were disabled. Um, oftentimes people think people with disabilities are just weird people or, or mean people, but it's just mostly a communication deficit and um, they don't fit the norms. They don't know the norms sometimes, or they're not in a great place. They're the, the way that the life has been, people with developmental disabilities are unfortunately really mistreated sometimes um, and, and don't have many people sometimes, sometimes some people have families and communities and just an incredible life that is the end would be the envy of many people. But in this last example, let's say it's someone who doesn't really have many people in their life and they're living alone and they have really combative relationships. So what do you do when that combative element comes up and you can feel yourself getting upset because you're being disrespected? It's like, be really careful with your words <laughs> um, and be really careful with your words in a lot of ways, but one of them is when you say you're gonna do something, do that thing and prioritize doing that thing. Because once you do that thing, you can let that person know, hey, that thing you asked me to do, I did it. And here's what they said the next step is. And then you see, how do you, what works for you? Like, this is our first time doing this. And you can even say that. You can be like, hey, so we're still getting to know each other. Um, it really worked well when you called me and you told me you needed this help. And, and now we did that. So in the future, I can do that again. Or if you want to, we can work together. So you can try to do that call on your own. You know, I can come to your house or we can do a three-way call. Offering options, but not so many that it's overwhelming. And mostly it's just that passage of time and being there, being next to your phone during your work day, taking it seriously that, the, that you're the point of contact for some people who need help. Um, and, and over time that trust develops and everything will get easier. In my experience, I've done this with, at this point, like 50, 60 people. Um, in, I'm in a new location, a new geographical location now. And so I'm developing relationships from scratch. I'm, I'm at a year now, which is not long at all in terms of getting to know people. A year is nothing. So just keeping in mind, there's so much I don't know and developing that trust and, and also in getting other people involved. You know, like maybe I'm not the right person to, to help with a specific issue because of gender or because of something about my style, you know, knowing when you're not in the best position to help and also um, creating a network of support. That's a big one for all three of these examples and just generally to, to take on the mentality of I'm going to help this person. Mm, mm, there's a lot that could maybe be going on there that's not so great. The more you get people who, who you feel are have integrity and um, have the ability to help, have the resources to help, the time um, and such, that's, that's way better than being the one point of contact. That's a lot of pressure on anyone. So mm -hmm. to spread it out and, and in the end, that looks like community. In the end, that, that's actually what community is, is sometimes someone needs help and that person changes in a group of people. And if we're there to help them, that's, that's community. And there's, of course, other aspects beyond just helping people. It's not all help, but the orientation, someone being helped constantly does something that's not so mm, forever. It's not so great for everyone to always feel like they're being helped. So how do you make that help invisible? 
How do you help someone without it being so clear that I'm helping you or I'm paid and I'm being, and I'm helping you. Um, better to not be paid and help people. It, there's something really subtle there. And so, so the degree that you can connect people to other things and, and they can develop confidence in reaching out to people who they need help from for things they, they want to do. Going back to the personal training thing, the, the fitness coaching thing, you don't want to create dependency. You want to create a network. This is my view. You want to create a, a resilient network of people so that if one person's sick or one person leaves a job, um, uh, that person has the tools to find the appropriate person to help. That's huge. To help, I'll just finish with this. To help people to learn how to ask for help is gigantic. Um, and then to help people to identify the appropriate person to ask for help is also gigantic. Those two things are, are fundamental in my, in my work. Um, mm -hmm. And that goes for me because there's situations I've never seen occurring every day in my work. And I have to know how to ask for help. It's not always easy to reach out to a supervisor. You know, you can feel like if I don't have the answer to this, maybe I'm not so good at my job. That's, that's a reasonable thought, a natural thought that can occur. If it's true, if it's not true, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, and then secondly, why would I reach out to my supervisor when I need to actually call the doctor's office to schedule an appointment? I'm not going to reach out to my supervisor and be like, hey, I need to make an appointment with the doctor's office for so-and-so. Nope, I'm going to go right to the doctor. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help my supervisor in a sense by not taking up their time so they can do their job, which is ideally in this field, helping someone directly or helping someone to help. And so it's a whole network. Um, it's a whole network of people ideally helping, supporting, and, and just existing and, you know, not, not trying to make people copies of yourself in the process, giving people all the choices. And, and that's kind of what my job is, is to research all the choices and be able to offer it and then see what people choose. And if the first one doesn't work that they choose, well, don't worry, we got two, three, four more choices. And um, I know that's a lot, but um, yeah, it's a, uh, <laughs> I don't know if there's a way for me to talk about it more cleanly because it is, um, it's so, it's so wide. So maybe talking about it in this messy way is actually the, the neatest way possible to say anything meaningful about it. I don't, I don't know. Mm. Yeah, I think you definitely said a lot in there that was highly meaningful. And uh, while it's specific to the role that you have and the location that you're in and, and your own experience of all of this, uh, it's, it's pretty clear to me how to transpose some of those sort of things into other contexts. I mean, for me, a lot of the time is, um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't do this professionally, but people do ask me for help with various things, big, small uh near far friend foe everything in between and uh um yeah i would like to be able to help if my help is asked for and it's something that i can actually do and it's you know also just knowing that i can't help is already uh you know at least getting out of the way to be like um <laughs> you know, I would love to help you, but I actually can't help you with this, um, mm, mm. is, is already a kind of kindness, I think, mm. um, to not like pretend like you can help when you can't or something. Yeah. 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 And also just to add on that, like to be aware of the act of asking for help and the vulnerability in that, mm. and to, to kind of hold that, hold that and support that until the person has found someone because, um, depends on the situation, but you know, you, even if you can't help, you can kind of, you can assist with momentum, mm -hmm. you know, um, just encouraging words can mean so much to some people. I mean, we never know what people are going through really mm -hmm. on, a, on a deep level. We don't know what's happening for them at that moment. And so it, it doesn't cost anything to be encouraging. It doesn't cost any, it's, it's like on social media. It doesn't cost anything to like something. And yet so many people are so stingy with their likes. Mm -hmm. And so just to be more genuinely encouraging when it feels right, when it feels appropriate, encouraging and yeah, helping with that momentum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there anything sort of near the broad swath of topics that we've covered that you'd like to 
say more about or talk more about? Um, I have a question for you. Mm. Is that okay? Sure. <laughs> so on the topic of helping, mm -hmm. I would love to hear from you about um, teaching Meta mm. and about how you have seen that help people. Um, I guess I'll just give a little bit of context for myself, which is that I think I was kind of allergic to Meta. Mm. I had the sense of like, oh, that's not really meditation. <laughs> like I had that, which was, I could see it that it was like a, a defense against something that I thought was going to bring things up for me. <laughs> so I was like, oh, that's not really meditation. And, and then when I started to do it, um, I found it very, very valuable. And um, I don't fully, you know, like you've, I'm assuming you've looked at meta way, way more than me and you've taught people meta. So I just, I, I don't have an, a sense of the varieties of how people can be helped or how that can be helpful for people or so that question. And then also like, can you see any ways that like the general principles of meta, like the ways that it works, the ways that it functions might be um, kind of secularized or, or just like, how do we bring this to people where it's not like you're enforcing meta on them, but you're maybe kind of able to pass off some of those benefits to people. Interesting. Okay. You know, I'm only, I'm the only one that's allowed to ask huge, enormous questions on this podcast, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I'm allowed to do that. You're not, no. Uh, yes. So the question is two parts, which is, uh, what are the varieties of how it helps people? And then can it be secularized and, and how? Yeah, like, can it be done in like a low key way where it's like, mm -hmm. you're making someone feel hopeful or, or wishing themselves well, wishing themselves to be at ease, wishing themselves to be free, and, and like all those positive qualities and go along with that. Like, mm -hmm. how do you, how can you make people feel that without using those words? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Um... It might be helpful before I answer this, if you would say a little bit about what your experience of it was, like you said earlier that you, well, you had resistance to it and then you tried it, but you made some tweaks and adaptations. What was your experience of that? Like what adjustments did you make? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Masterful job, by the way, turning the tables on me. Uh -huh. And I see, I see what you're doing. Uh -huh. I, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, so the way you taught it to me was through Shinzen's. Mm -hmm. um, system, the, the vocabulary that Shinzen uses. Um, and uh, so I just didn't like those words. Mm -hmm. Those words didn't really work for me. Mm -hmm. And so I had been previously resistant. Those words didn't work for me, but also when I did them, I did notice a shift. I did mm -hmm. notice something, but I was like, ah, this doesn't really feel appropriate for me. Mm -hmm. And so I re-examined some of the traditional prompts mm -hmm. that I don't even know where I heard them from, but um, uh so so you can substitute i for an individual or for all beings you know any 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 categories you want really but um you know i just i started trying you know may may i or may all beings be at ease may i or may all beings be well and may i or may all beings or or any individual be free and i i recognize that in those three statements was everything really that I kind of hoped for, for myself. It doesn't mean that there's never gonna be pain, but if there is pain, there's ease with it and there's there's wellness with it and there's freedom with it, you know? Like, so it's quite comprehensive. And and so if I was experiencing just uh, maybe negative self-talk, you know, using Metta for an entire sit or for, for multiple sits in a row, I noticed had a significant impact on that negative self-talk. and over a long enough period of time, the negative self-talk that's just kind of on autopilot, I think, if we pick it up, you know, our culture, we use really harsh language, jokingly sometimes, but also sometimes it's used under the guise of a joke, but it's not such a joke and it, it can sink in. And so meta is sort of just like, you know, you're, you're, you're adding this positive, wholesome stuff to the pot. And mm -hmm. so uh, say that like, it's just a big swirling, stew of potential thoughts and you put your spoon in and you pull one out well if you've been doing more meta lately or in general you're more likely to pull out one of these really wholesome um messages to yourself instead of oh god i screwed up again oh i did it wrong oh, I, I can't do this 
you're more likely to pull out a message that is, um, you know, positive, like keep going, you're doing the best you can. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> these wholesome messages that can be laughed at, but generally speaking, in my experience and, and relating that back to my job, this is true. I have found it to be true that people are doing their best, mm -hmm. <laughs> like they are trying their best. And so to have that message come up that I'm doing my best, that's great to have a message that, oh, you can't do this, not helpful, mm -hmm. um, not wrong. It's not like you should punish yourself for having that thought, but not helpful. And so Meta just um, seeded, seeded the pot mm. um, with more positive messages, which then allowed me to move into territory that um, relied a little bit on uh, maybe more tranquility and uh, nothing kind of jarring, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's a specific for a specific method. You know, mm -hmm. this is not like some general statement on meditation, but that, that was for a specific thing I was working on then. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, I think mm, probably this is overly simplistic, but, um, I'm planning to write a whole book on loving kindness at this point. So uh, circle, if you think that this is an overly simplistic account, <laughs> whoever's listening to this can circle back and read the full book length account. Um, uh, but for the sake of this conversation, I'll simplify and say that it's actually mm, pretty straightforward how Meta helps people um, at least like phenomenologically. Uh, I don't know as much about the sort of like psychology or spiritual workings of it, but uh, you know, I have conjectures about that, but phenomenologically, I think it's pretty straightforward. And that's why I sort of lean on Shinzen system. Fundamentally, I think the way I teach it is from Shinzen system. Um, I, I sort of do it with a different style, but mm. the, the sort of fundamental theory of it comes from Shinzen system. And um, yeah, it's, it's like the way I think about it is Oh, oh, so while that's simple, what's actually quite complex, and I didn't expect this, is the variety of responses and even especially negative responses that people can have to Meta because um, basically the problems that I had with it are not necessarily the problems that other people will have with it. And mm -hmm. some people have like very allergic reactions to it. Um, and I've, I've learned a lot about that. So, um, mm -hmm. but the, the way, like the, the ideal case in which it goes well for someone is pretty straightforward to explain, which is, they're using either mental talk or what Shinzen would call herein uh, in his older systems. Uh, I don't know what he calls it these days, but mental talk or herein or visual images see in to create some kind of resonant positive feelings in the body. And often there's a stage where like that's not really available. And so it's primarily mental. It's primarily either image or talk or both. Mm -hmm. um, but then ideally you get to the point where you're starting to feel something in your body even small. Mm. And then you, I, this is the phrase, uh, the sort of my trademark phrase with the meditations that I use, but I say, really enjoy it, right? Really enjoy it. Uh, um, people, including me, like to make fun of me for saying this, but that's, that's like basically the instruction is like, no, there's this pleasure there. And I know it's small to start and it seems mm. like not a big deal. You know, it's not um, like an amazing dinner at a restaurant or like, you know, a wild night with your friends or something. It's just like a little bubbly feeling in your chest or something, but like mm -hmm. really enjoy it. You know, uh, mm. that's the instruction because when you enjoy it, when you pay attention to it with a, with an attitude of enjoyment, then it spreads and grows and becomes bigger and bigger. And then mm. more good things continue to happen. Mm. Um, and so from that perspective, looking at it that way, right. It's, it's basically like an equation of like image plus talk, or just one of those leads to positive emotions in the body. And from that mm. perspective, it's actually quite easy to secularize. And it, it's even broader than the way it, a lot of it's conceived. So I actually don't tend to like the traditional phrases, although they think they're beautiful and I've practiced with them myself. But like those don't really resonate for a lot of people, um, both in the sense of like the vocabulary turns them off and the phrases, even if, even if it doesn't turn them off, it doesn't create those positive feelings in the body. Mm. Whereas mm. there's a phrase that you, you used, uh, like you're doing your best. Like that's the example of a phrase that would have much more of a like emotional oh, response lovely. in the body. That's lovely. Um, and you can do the same thing with images, right? There's this whole mm. territory of like, 
I like to imagine my friends and visualize them with a smile on their face mm. uh, or like memories, shared memories that we've had that we were happy together. Mm. Um, and all of that is totally easy to secularize. It doesn't matter really what image and talk you use so long as it's positive and ideally that it creates positive responses in the body. And, mm. and in fact, that has to be very, um, you have to be very attuned to what does work for you and what doesn't. And it, there's, there is a process of sort of customization there where you refine you know, you, you notice and refine what works for you and steer towards the things that work and steer mm -hmm. away from the things that don't work. Yeah. Mm. Does That's that answer lovely. your question? It does. Yeah, it totally does. I had never thought of, I mean, I had just said it and then you repeated it back to me, but I had never thought of encouraging someone in like a super normal way, the way that we often do just to be like, Hey, you know, when you're, when you're having that hard time and it's like late at night, and, you know, I'm not available to talk to, and I'm thinking of someone who literally I'm one of the few people that they, they call mm -hmm. that they have in their life like that, just to be able to say, Hey, if it's late at night, first of all, you have all these other people. There are other services you can call. They're not personalized to you. Maybe they're going to listen to you, but they can't do too much, but just to be able to say, Hey, if this is happening, just try to think to yourself, try to remember that like you're doing the best you can, you know? Mm -hmm. And that is, that's exactly what I was asking. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And it sounds silly that I wouldn't think to say that sort of thing to people, mm -hmm. but I I have never thought to say that sort of thing to people, mm -hmm. you know? I, I say those sorts of things. I'll say, you're doing your best, or I see you doing your best. Mm -hmm. I think you're doing your best. I think you're going in a great, great direction. Keep up, keep up the good work. Um, but I've never thought to actually just you know, just put it out there, you know, um, I never Maybe I'll notice like your, your tone of voice is totally different. Like the, the way mm. that the phrases are often taught, like traditionally in a Buddhist meditation context, it's sort of, I'm, I'm going to make a caricature here, but, yeah, yeah. but the sort of way is like, may all beings be happy, you know, <laughs> which is something I've based my life around. But if you phrase oh. it like that in that monotonous voice and, you know, may all beings like that can be sort of abstract or something, mm -hmm. but the, the way, the tone of voice that you're using to say like, Hey, you're doing your best, man. Like, I love you. I care about yeah. you. I'm so proud of you. Like that kind of thing. The tone is totally different. And that, yep. that's how I'd say, um, you know, other teachers do this as well, but I was talking about a different style and I really try to use my voice expressively to convey and demonstrate what meta is and what it feels like mm. and 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 ideally create that response for people mm. um, when mm. I do the guidances and actually that that makes me think you know in your in your work situation if it's helpful just as an idea you could record your own voice saying some of these phrases that you would say to your clients and say hey mm -hmm. if it's late at night you can listen to this three minute recording of me mm. saying hey i know you're doing your best it's hard i know whatever it is that you say <laughs> mm. uh, so it's actually your voice for them yeah yeah it you know that's i like that idea in if a situation came up where that was appropriate like mm -hmm. that sounds like a really good idea and also it bumps up with the people i'm thinking of who i'm working with right now it bumps up against this line of kind of um um when i'm trying to help people when I'm in a position to help people and I'm trying to help them, I don't want to take up an outsized influence, mm. you know, like there's a line and, and it's, 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 it's going to be individual, individual on my end and individual on their end. It has to be right. And so, um, that's a really nice idea mm. for some people. Um, like it's the kind of thing that I would ask my supervisor about, cause it's mm. like, is this crossing a line? Like probably isn't, but I would just want to get like a second opinion if I thought it was good for someone, but for some people, Unfortunately, what can happen when someone's helping them is they can become a bit obsessive mm -hmm. about that individual. They can okay. start to idealize that individual. They can start to get very upset if that individual is not available to help them. And mm -hmm. so mm, a lot of a lot of like what I'm doing in my job is like feeling that boundary and and trying to be um, at the appropriate distance, be available, mm -hmm. be, be at the appropriate distance and um, I could see that being so useful and I could also see that it all depends on the circumstance, you know, but, mm -hmm. um, I wish there was, um, I wish there was something like that just available, like on phones, you know, mm -hmm. like an app that just is like preloaded with these positive messages mm -hmm. and, and people could just like, not even preloaded, but easily, easy to download and not going to like spy on you and <laughs> put malware on your phone and not even There's, like a guided uh... meditation, you know? It's, it's not quite the same, but I mean, you really 
uh, you can use like the voice memo apps for this sort of thing. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, in fact, I think um, something I've seen people do, there's practices of this, but is, is record that kind of thing for yourself and mm -hmm. then play it again and play it over and over again. And yeah. um, I think that can be very powerful. Yeah, it, but it comes up again for me that like the context of, of, um, of working with individuals with developmental disabilities I have this context that like I have not adequately shared mm. um, or that's difficult to share. And so like when you say that, I notice it because like my clients to a significant degree, they have smartphones, but they can't navigate their smartphones. Mm. And, and they're actually a source of significant stress for mm. them because they're not simple. They're confusing. Um, even getting a phone call from a wrong number is like an event in many of my clients' life, lives, it causes them great stress because mm. someone's calling them thinking they're someone else. And so mm. like, I, I, this is just like a wish, I suppose, but like, I just wish that more technology was developed with the varieties of ability in mind because technology is taking up such an outsized, um, has such an outsized influence and also an outsized um, degree of utility in some ways, but even using a voice memo app and then expecting a client to be able to access that voice memo mm. sounds so simple, but it's, it's, it's too much. It's okay. too much. If it's a single button that like can be right on the front page of their phone, like, okay, sure. But even that, like, there's a lot of ways that things can get confusing. And it's just like, to, to, to a certain degree, it's like in the world that, that we live in now, so different from 25 years ago with technology, a lot of what I do is to like mediate that mm. for my clients because it's not a friendly world. Like mm. the, te the technology stuff is, it's not friendly. It's, it's as we know, sometimes exploitative, manipulative. Mm. And um, yeah, yeah. If anyone out there is listening who's good with technology, uh, I don't know, maybe you could do some nice stuff. <laughs> even just raising awareness about it i think it's yeah, yeah 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 mm -hmm. which i'm appreciative for this opportunity to talk you know for for that purpose as well as others just to um to talk about that you know you asked if there's anything else you know and i guess just like i i hope that whatever i've said just kind of expresses the fact that there's a lot of people there's a lot of people in cities um in towns across the world who who have what we call developmental disabilities and we've used different words to refer to that over time and it's you know the terminology changes but um the way that it impacts people um is significant and the way that impacts communities the way that impacts people who don't have disabilities i think is quite significant and to a large degree the individuals with disabilities and the impact that their treatment and, and, and the fallout of the lack of treatment and support in some cases, I think there's a lot that we can improve about our, mm, unfortunately, presently significantly atomized culture. Like a lot could be improved by, by considering how could this work for people of the lowest ability mm. um, or for, for varying abilities. And there's some things happening like that, but. Um, yeah, there's just there's there's people in communities. As long as you're living around other people, uh, beyond a certain point, there are people in, in your community who could really use your help in some really basic ways. That if you're listening to this, you're probably equipped to do. So um, I just I would love I would love to think that maybe this conversation has resulted in one person finding a way to to help to help another person, disability or not. But um, I think if you if you can't find anyone who you think maybe needs help. Well, you get paid to learn to help people with disabilities. It's a field with um, seemingly endless vacancies. It's a mm. field with extremely high turnover. It's a field that I think is is really ripe for innovation, and that I think the, the private sector and the, the the tools of people in tech would really be they would be able to have a significant impact on the lives of people. Um, I think there's 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 economic impacts, there's significant communal benefits, community benefits. And so, 
yeah, that's that's something that's on my mind a lot, but um, kind of unformed, you know, like I'm not trying to force that on anyone. <laughs> like hey you got the skills you should do this it's, mm. you know it's it's too big it's too big for that yeah i'm really appreciating the chance to fill out your expertise on a lot of these things because well i i've had the, the privilege of knowing about them and being aware of them but um i've seen you make various comments about these kinds of issues on the timeline on twitter and um yeah just just affording the chance to kind of show where this is coming from and where these these thoughts are coming from and where your experiences mm. are and that they're relevant. Uh, not just some random guy on the timeline saying, well, here's how I think these things should go. Yeah. Like, this is your job. So mm -hmm. yeah, not that it's easy or you're perfect or something, but I just think you have a lot of relevant experience and mm. uh, wisdom about the kinds of challenges there are. And I've appreciated hearing about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just off of that too, I think that that sort of work pairs really well. If you're doing um, uh, meditation training mm -hmm. or spiritual training, it's a field where you're going to be able to put the, the supposed fruits, the purported benefits mm -hmm. will be put to the test uh -huh. in the same way they say that like, oh, you want to know how your practice is? Go visit your family. Mm -hmm. It's very similar. Um, uh, I found that they paired very well and also, I think in this, in this sort of like uh, the, the, the Buddhist, the young Buddhist world uh, or the online Buddhist world, it seems like there's some people who have real tension around like their form of livelihood. Hmm. And I'm not saying that this is right livelihood for someone if you're using that, mm -hmm. that, that uh, frame. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it would be right livelihood for you because each person's situation is different, but to my mind and, and based on my explorations, it is um, an area that is quite unique in terms of its um, availability of jobs where you have to do very little beyond helping people um, to, to, to eat and to drink and to care for themselves and to sleep and to be safe and free from fear. Mm. It's like very basic. You're helping in a very basic way. I mean, we talked about helping in a very basic way generally, but it only gets more complicated. So like, if you're not sure how to help, those are some things that you can relate to when you're hungry and you can't feed yourself. Wouldn't you love someone who's going to help you with dignity to do that with dignity or to care for yourself in the bathroom? Um, if you're not sure what you can do in the world, that's not evil. If, if you're in that mode, this is a field with, I mean, there's bonuses, sign-on bonuses. Every agency I know about has sign-on bonuses. The, the, the vacancies are incredible right now, especially with, with what's happened with COVID. And so mm -hmm. I, I dream, I dream of a day when maybe there's a, maybe there's a, a pipeline of sorts between people who are practicing these things, these things, young people who can't find opportunities that really resonate with them and um, working in this field and hopefully getting paid a living wage, you know, getting paid enough and having communities based on caring for, for each other. I know I sound like some sort of utopian sicko thinking that we can care for each other, but I mean, I hope to get old. I hope to get old and, and I hope, well, I don't hope to be dependent on people, but it's a chance, there's a possibility I will be dependent on people. And I hope that there's younger people than me who will help to care for me in a way that, that I, I find respectful or I feel treated with dignity, you know? Um, and I guess if you think you're any different, if, if, if someone out there listening thinks that they're not gonna get old and they're not gonna be in a position of needing help and they don't care if anyone younger than them is well-trained and able to do that with, with dignity and respect for them, I would ask them to maybe examine <laughs> the biological realities of their life and to look at old people, you know, to, to see what it's like to get old. Um, I know it's not polite, right? It's not nice to remind people of these mm -hmm. things. People don't like to be reminded of death or that they're animals. Mm -hmm. And I just did both. So hello. <laughs> hello. Um, hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to say about uh, anything else that we've talked about? Nope. How about you? Hmm. I'm acutely aware of many things I would love to talk about more <laughs> with you, which is why I'm going to have you back on. 
Okay. <laughs> come back on sometime. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Hmm. Well, thank you so much, Chris. It was really lovely to talk to you, and I appreciate you uh, coming out of your shell of sorts with uh, <laughs> fear of speaking in a way oh that boy. would harm others. Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> <a> benefit. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And um, yeah, I hope that something I said here was useful. And I hope that, you know, I hope I didn't say anything that's that's going to lead to um, harm. But um, I guess that's just those are the chances you take when you live. Right. That's just life. It is life. Yeah. Yeah. You try your best. You're trying your yeah. best, Chris. Nice work. Thank you. Thank you. Look I'm at that. Full you. circle. <laughs> I love you. Buddy. I love you too, Tashin. All right. Bye, Fred. All right. Goodbye.